Welcome back and thank you again for joining us. Um, we're here now at the Cold War Continuum, coming to part four, which we've entitled Interrupting Transmission, Transversal Border Crossings from the Cold War to the Dance Floor. And it's my great pleasure to be joined by Dr. Kirsten Meissen, sorry, Meissner, and Sarah Farina. Um, I'm just going to do a little short bio of the both of them and then we can um, maybe enjoy a sort of free-flowing conversation here. Okay, so Dr. Kerstin Meissner is an education researcher focusing on belonging, power relations, and social inequality. She teaches, writes, and researches at the intersections of critical, sorry, critical education, cultural practice, and philosophy, and explores the possibilities of academia, art, and education to inspire social change and well-being. Sound and music are a, spe are a specific field of interest in her work. Kirsten currently holds the substitution and administration of the junior professorship in intercultural education at Technical University Chemnitz. Sarah Farina is an international DJ, producer and activist. She hosts her own club night, Rec Room, with DJ Uta, Kepler and Luzi. She's innovative, she's skillful, and she's the smiling antithesis of genre cliques and sour scene <laughs> elitists and sprinkles positivity over the darkest space. What you hear is all you need to know. Great, I like that. And what you'll hear from Sara Farina's sets and music productions are seamlessly blended bass heavy frequencies and futuristic beats with fearless forays through the hardcore continuum and beyond. It's inclusive, forward-thinking, and unrestrained. It's a genre reject. Re sorry, it's a genre rejecting style that she's named rainbow bass. So I'm so honoured and pleased to have you both here. Um, and um, what I ha had hoped to do in uh, pre-discussions was to think about this part of the day um, as a more free-flowing conversation. Um, and one of the ways in which I wanted to start was to think about how if we think how the day itself, when we think about the Cold War continuum, it tends to get co-opted by questions which Professor Lewis Judy Saki spoke to in the previous session of kind of a masculinist, you know, male provocation, male posturing um, that doesn't allow for a space for the idea, even though they have been there for a very long time, of women producers, women activists, um, you know, the centrality of women to sound system culture, not necessarily reduced or relegated to just a simple dancer, or um, I wouldn't say it's a reduction to be a, or a, um, a singer. However, it's not the vocal, um, uh, the vocal capacities that are being called on. Um, you know, that women are increasingly, I think, Sarah, um, and particularly with your ideas, uh, sorry, particularly of your being quite or most renounced for um, breaking with this convention of the idea that base equals male. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I, I wanted us to think about, you know, perhaps by starting to think about the possibilities that sound can offer us as women, as perhaps other marginalized identities, um, where we can get away from this construction of sound as a kind of male preserve, and particularly, you know, whether in DJ culture or when we think about sort of sound, sound um, production, that production is largely about men. So I, I don't know, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, um, thank you so much, first of all, uh, for this nice introduction and for the, all of the work you've been doing today <laughs> and before that, like, <laughs> shout out to you. Kind of you. <laughs> thank you. High five. <laughs> and um, just one thing, when you read about Kerstin, I had this feeling of being so proud of my friend. That was just really nice. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so shout out to Kerstin. Yes, um, shout out to, to us. Yay. <laughs> <Hey. laughs> um, yeah, interesting question. And I mean, the work that we do with transmission, um, it's, yeah, the politics of the dance floor, right? And, you know, for me being a music lover and a music uh, producer and DJ, 
the dance floor or the idea of a dance floor was always like sort of this place where I could um, experience some sort of utopia where my skin color or my gender and like the best case is like it doesn't even matter really. I can just be my authentic self and I'm not being judged for it. But um, of course there are systems in place also in the music industry and everywhere that remind you in really terrible ways often or want to say to you basically that you don't belong there. Mm. But I think um, that's why music educational work is so important to remind people who created those dance floors and all those cultures that we love so much, especially in Berlin here. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think um, in Berlin, which has become you know, globally renowned for its techno scene, um, and that being, I mean, I remember my sort of first experiences at Berghain, and it being um, one of it, on the one sense that um, it was an open space, but it was a, a space where only it could only be open if you were willing to listen to a certain way of hearing and being in music. That's not, I, I'm, I don't mean that simply in the sense of it's a scene, it's a, you know, and it has a particular crowd that comes with it. But it was, uh, I think we've in the past sort of talked about ways of moving. Um, and maybe this is perhaps tied to sort of your, your critical pedag pedagogy as well in terms of um, yeah, using music and sound as, a, as a, I was going to say a weapon, <laughs> maybe not when we're thinking about schools, but as a medium through which to start relating to the body, to conceptions of otherness. I mean, I, I note that um, your publication, your, bo your book was about relationality and belonging. And I think, my German's not great, but I think is it becoming with others? The sort of the literal translation. So yeah, maybe if you can say something a little about how those facets maybe meet in terms of how you engage with sound and how sounds can be used to educate. Um, well, first of all, thank you as well, Jessica, for this is inviting a very us. And yeah, it's circle. oh yeah, <laughs> it's just great. because you know everything is digital, <laughs> and now we're here, also appreciating being in a space yeah. with um, great people and physical, yeah. yes. <laughs> physical space. <laughs> it's been too long. Well, I um, came to sound through my love for music, and I remember actually uh, talking to Mala one day, um, being in London. He was like your work on, on belonging, do you also use the dance floor or the club space as a kind of research area? And I was like, no, because I'm not interested in very literal spaces and very literal ideas of belonging, but more understanding it as a kind of philosophical concept. Mm -hmm. But that kind of um, thought stuck with me. And I was reading a lot about sound and sound theory and started to think about how our idea of belonging is always reduced to some sort of material or visual reality. So you identify with what you see and um, or with what you probably don't see, also the whole idea of um, representation. And then thinking about sound as this, um, yeah, as you said, kind of transversal um, medium mm. that it doesn't fit into binary um, norms of either this or that, but creates this um, and yeah. and connecting things, connecting the past and the future, because mm -hmm. what you hear in the moment is like a discontinuity of what happened before and what is coming. I think um, Steve Goodman has said that as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of an interconnecting medium yeah. because it, it gets into you and it's not necessarily needed or you don't necessarily need like um, the listening ear to perceive it. And the amazing thing about bass is that it kind of really brings your body into vibration, even if you're not able to yeah. kind of perceive yeah. the sound through the ear. And thinking, really thinking about sound as a kind of touch rather yeah. than, um, yeah, yeah and, and how it kind of connects to your, yeah. um, to your body. Um, and I think it's just a beautiful metaphor, but also medium method and strategy to use sound. And we are, we are ignoring sound a lot within educational spaces as well. Mm. Like who has to be silent, who is able or allowed to be noisy, what is considered noise, all these questions like we don't really relate to um, within education or formal education. And, I mean, whether it's, whether it's the case here in, in, in Germany, 
but in the UK, the continual cutting to the arts budgets within schools, so children don't even have the opportunity to learn instruments. And here, a different mode of sounding, you know, we have the everyday sounding of our voices and music as it comes through stereos or whatever. But, you know, maybe that sounding also through, um, yeah, through, through instruments is another mode of... Um, Yes, engaging, engage in the body with the certain frequencies yeah, that operate through the body. Like yes. people who live close to these um, um, renewable energy mm. um, windmills Wind and, and, and yes. create that create that kind of um, um, vibration in, in the air and mm. people feel discomfort living mm. there or mm. have difficulty sleeping and there is a lot of research that has to be done. But it, there is this um, unconscious layer of sound which I really think is an amazing tool um, and has to be looked at more. Okay, so I wondered, um, in your meeting, um, the activist, the DJ, the DJ activist, I mean, I, I, I loved this, um, this phrase, I think, um, if so many people love music, or so many, yes, if so many people love music, why aren't more musicians activists? Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, between the two of you, I see this, this real desire to actually change how we engage with spaces, how we produce spaces, how we navigate spaces, how we open up spaces, whether for marginalized or queer or, um, you know, for a whole swathe of identities who have historically, yeah, you know, I've had those moments of walking to a club when I was younger and, um, you know, sort of a quick about turn, you know that's not a space for you. Um, and being made to feel that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just wondered if you could talk us through, first of the, the transmission mission, you know, wh why transmission? I mean, I, I've sort of taken that title for this section of our, of our discussion. Um, you know, what, is, what does it mean to transmit? What are you trans, <coughs> excuse me, what are you transmitting? Um, and how can transmission disrupt the normative, where the normative is what has, you know, the everyday, where the normative has marginalized one? Maybe that's to both of you, in fact. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Kirsten came up with the name, so. <laughs> um, but I'm going to say, uh, yeah, I mean, we're friends, and our, you know, shared pa passion for music and the dance floor is what has uh, connected us first. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've, I feel like I don't even have, have a choice to not be political because my body is political, you know, and mm -hmm. it always has been like that. And now when you get older, you find the right terms to understand what is happening mm -hmm. to you and to understand the systems you're born into. And I just realized that, um, you know, exploring the dance floor and clubbing in Berlin when I moved here more than 10 years ago, that this can be kind of like a space where you can feel unity mm -hmm. and um, feel connected to others. And also when I started DJing and had the chances to travel to Asia, for example, mm -hmm. where um, I don't speak the languages there and they don't speak mine, but through music we can connect. Yeah. And that was like one of the most beautiful experiences ever, like to feel really the power of music, you know. And... Um, but the thing is, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, with all the media outlets that we have and music club culture, it wasn't so normalized to speak about the politics that are involved. Mm. Now, through Black Lives Matter and so on, they have to do that in order to stay relevant. Yeah. But there wasn't really like a home mm. for those conversations. Mm -hmm. So we basically thought, well, then we created our, when we do it ourselves, you know, and, um, you know, it's, it's very important for us to have offline spaces as well. Of course, now it's COVID, but yeah. <laughs> when this is uh, getting better, we really want to exchange with people and, you know, um, build networks and all of that. Because, yeah, we need those real exchanges because right now we are so much online and it's not really sustainable mm -hmm. often. And there's so much fighting <laughs> online and all of that so yeah i think maybe you know maybe because there has been a sort of dense separation from the body mm -hmm. i mean yes we can and it's not quite the same sort of dial in 
to DJ sets, you know, online through Zoom or, you know, whatever. And you can have a little dance around your room, but it's not the same as being in that sort of collective assemblage of of people in the club, you know, um, feeling the music, you know, as it resonates and vibrates through the space. Um, so, yeah, there's this loss of... And also because bodies are much more constrained in this time. You can't go here. We have to sit like this. We can't, you know, we can't exchange in that sense. I think, you know, there's this um, loss of phys physicality and the sonic and how that plays in, in, the, in the body when you're, you know, when you're allowed to be in a club and move and... Um, yeah, but sorry, I, I just inter interrupted you, Kirsten, before asking you about transmission. Um, sorry, that was just my little interjection there. But yes, no, thinking about um, transmission for you, I mean, I, I see it as sort of a, two, is it a two-part sort of message, breaking down the trans, as in, I don't want to put words into your mouth in this sense, but. Um, actually, I think we haven't considered that before, okay. I guess. Um, Maybe it's it's a multi-layered answer, mm -hmm. and I have to kind of uh, sort my thoughts to not uh, make this whole diversion and then come back. Um, first of all, I think we aren't the first who are doing this, um, which I think is really important to say. But we kind of realized that I bring like this whole academia um, baggage, and Sarah brings the DJ um, baggage, so we have this really valuable um, bouquet of experience mm -hmm. and different angles that we can look at things and meeting at the dance floor or outside of the dance floor and then um, discussing things. It's always really wonderful to see these different layers coming together and actually just adding valuable thoughts. Um, and it's really difficult to be a kind of activist academic or academic activist mm -hmm. within the German academia because it is so conservative in ways and it holds this very distinct idea of knowledge and knowledge production and who is entitled to but then it doesn't reflect all these difficult ways of entering it and um, who is allowed in and who is allowed to speak and within that position from the from this academic um, space you you kind of always have been given more value um, to, to your words or thoughts. And I think it's really important to connect that kind of knowledge within like academic institutions mm -hmm. to um, knowledge production from social movements. Mm. And my way to music was, um, I was born um, just before the wall came down in the eastern part of Germany, yeah. so it kind of fits to, to, the, to, uh, the, whole theme of to the whole theme of today. Yeah, yeah. And I grew up in the early 90s in Eastern Germany with all the stereotypes that you can imagine. And music was a counterculture and it presented a counterculture. We had a sound system in the small town that I grew up in. We had parties, we had a big like hardcore scene. Mm -hmm. And it was always my kind of sanctuary. And um, so for me, it's sound on the one hand, but then music as a particular also cultural production or expression on the other hand. Yeah. And coming together with Sarah and looking at, oh, things that go wrong in society actually are also topics um, within club spaces and underground culture. And the same thing with left, like people who consider themselves uh, being left still can be racist and still can be sexist, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So even though you consider yourself being part of, of underground culture, you're not necessarily reflecting on, on power relations and all of that. So, yeah, we've been talking about creating something and then um, it happened by chance that we uh, were creating this panel at House of World Cultures. Um, we were reaching out to them, create, or wanting to, to present a conference and then they invited us to create this panel discussion and then COVID happened. So that's yes. how the podcast happened, just yeah. to give a little insight on, on our own um, journey. And it's just beautiful to create space and bring people together. I mean, there's amazing people like Juba just launched her own um, podcast. Um, I think it's called Assurance. Assurance yeah. mm -hmm. Check it out. Um, and other people who are doing uh, great work, but also within last year's um, kind of activation or reactivation of um, maybe not the majority, but people who were activated through the Black Lives Matter movement. There was a big lack of um, 
reflections within culture and especially music uh, culture. And you had like um, spaces like Dweller Forever who are um, posting about um, the black history of techno and house music. And in Germany, you can go uh, to parties where it's like uh, black music, <laughs> which is always considered uh, R&B and hip hop and then house and techno. And so there's a lot of history that has to be retold or told at all. I mean, how, how does one create these? Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> sorry, that suddenly just stopped to think, like, deep thought. <laughs> how does one hold a mic? Um, yeah, no, I was just thinking, how does one create a space to, that's heterogeneous enough, that's mixed enough to allow the flow of all those identities? where it's not that at the door you leave all your prejudices just because you want to go and dance, but actually that there's a real sort of engagement, there's a real desire to engage with one another. And whether that comes through the music, I mean, I think um, to come back to sort of a gender, que sorry, a gender question, and thinking about, um, we've obviously been thinking about sound systems throughout the course of today, and when we think about, you know, the <clears throat> the archetype of the Jamaican sound system, or as the sound system has been diasporized, it's usually, you know, male selector, male MCs, you know, the engineers, everybody is male. I mean, obviously in Britain you, you're getting a few female-led and designed and made sound systems. But I, I think one of the kind of powerful dynamics of the DJ is that you create, yeah, you create the atmosphere, you create the, you can channel people, right? Um, yeah, so I just wondered if you might be able to say more, and, and particularly being, sometimes I really hate that phrase, a female DJ. <laughs> It's like, she's a DJ, right? Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Yes, so... DJ. <laughs> no, yeah, DJ. no I, but I also don't want to shame people who use that word. Do whatever you yeah. want. Um, yes, so as a DJ, I ha have a responsibility, I believe, you know. For me, it's just more than just playing music that I love. Mm. And, um, you know, when you were describing that space or safer space, mm. I guess... Um, it's a utopia, of course. There won't be ever a space that works for everyone. Mm. Um, but I believe that spaces or parties that um, work on that are usually better parties, you know, yeah. because people can let go and just be themselves without being in fear of anything. Mm. Mm. And um, what I love about DJing, it's just like this energy exchange. And you can, like, basically tell a story and... I always try to create DJ sets that kind of like um, can give joy to people who are absolute music nerds, but also to people who maybe have never heard this kind of music before. You know, I want to make it accessible and make it fun, first mm -hmm. of all, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, like throw in some surprises and what Kerstin also mentioned, like, you know, it's about the future, the past and the present. And that's why, that's what I teach in my DJ workshops. I'm like, there's, you know, there's a technical side, but there's also a spiritual side to yeah. it. And um, I believe that music education or reading about and learning about the music history is so much fun and so important because, or in my case, I started listening, listening to the music in a different way because I got to learn about the people behind the music, behind the culture and the circumstances that they were living in. And, you know, when we spoke before, um, um, I, I told you that when I was in Detroit, I really mm. realized that especially techno and house music was like a spiritual response yes. yeah. um, from the black community mm. there. And also just me having the privilege and opportunity through Music Board with the residency program to go there and actually really meet people like Mike Banks and mm. hang out with them and listen to their stories and... Um, what I'd like to mention there is that intergenerational conversations are so important yeah. and it's so important to learn so much from each other because sometimes I feel like younger people, they're like, no, I know already everything. I know everything. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and yes, we can research online, mm -hmm. but there's nothing better than having a real conversation mm -hmm. and really speaking 
or talking to the people, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's not always possible, but like I highly recommend that if you have the chance to. Um, yeah, and and we spoke about that too, right? About churches. Yes. Right. We talked <laughs> about the Pentecostal church, but also yeah. the I mean the church tradition in the states. Mm -hmm. um, you know these much more vibrant. Um, you know they're completely bodily. The you could be in a club, mm -hmm. right? It's such a you know it's such a dynamic and you know um, you know with spirits spirit possession or mm. you know the spirit speaking through you. Um, you know you're there half the day maybe, but it's the yeah it's this resonance chamber in which something is passing between people and whether you go for the music. I think we talked about this before yeah. of whether you go because the music is great. You know you may not have you, you may not want to be a, be a, a be a believer or be a believer, but actually you can enjoy it on this level of just you know, it's great music and it moves you in some way, which is obviously to come back to that club experience. Yeah, right? and I feel like yeah. we should give those places more credit mm. sometimes, mm. you know, because I um, asked Mike Banks from Underground Resistance, like, hey, can you recommend any church there? And he's like, yeah, you go to my church. Um, that's where I learned uh, to play how, uh, to learn how to play uh, the keyboard and guitar. Yeah. And there's also something interesting that loads of these amazing techno and house uh pioneers learned their music in those spaces and so I went there and I'm not a religion person but it reminded me so much of the dance floor and I felt mm. so good afterwards and I don't know it was just so much fun and the music was amazing you know and um, it's just beautiful how the spirit of the dance floor <laughs> I don't know it can be found anywhere sometimes. I, I liked what you said um, you know about the no, I can't remember what you said. It was something um, about like the energy transfer. Yeah, like yeah. energy exchange. Uh, energy exchange because it, it made. I think I um, for sort of preparation for this. I was reading, you know, the French philosopher Bourdieu, and he talks whilst he's talking about play, and he's talking about you know the um, sports people who have acquired the greatest skill and seeing ahead. You're like futurist, and I, I know that the. Um, um, the uh, British Jamaican academic Julian Enriquez talks about the kind of the cybernetics on the dance floor and, um, and particularly he's writing about sound systems but he's saying that the DJ and he's talking sound system culture but I think this can be sort of um, uh, expanded has to be in terms of being an operator has to be able to cue into that energy to um, pre preempt to be able to make people move in the way you want them to move. So, I mean, it's whether it's like religion and trying to shape the spirit, shape the dynamic, shape the atmosphere, shape the, yeah, the energy, you know, of, of, of the space is, um, yeah, I think what a good, I think we would call it like an affect engineer, shaping the mood, shaping the, the space. And I think that, that that's one of the things that very much drew me to sort of the, the transmission mission between between the both of you and trying to um, create these new spaces, but also um, what I I really love this this um, work in sort of slogan together we de we deconstruct in order to rebuild, and I was thinking in the context of the Cold War continuum, and I think we talked a little bit about it before, of how with the fall of the wall you had this evacuation of these spaces in Berlin and the possibility of what that might have offered, um, uh, you know, offered new, the emergence of new identities, new emergence of new um, musics. And then I was reading within um, your, or oh, reading, hearing within your podcast, you have one of your podcasts around um, the sense of, you know, club culture that took over some of these spaces and then you know that they become these spaces that become so mon monetized and then where does one go when these spaces become prohibitive whether financially or where if you're not <laughs> the right thing you don't get in I mean this happens more and more or it becomes uh, you know wholly gentrified and um, the neighborhood's much more uh, much more I interested in keeping the noise levels down at night than actually allowing some sort of, 
you know, communality at the weekend, for God's sake. <laughs> so I wonder if one of you could maybe think about, or just maybe talk to talk a little bit more about this engagement, because this is part of the sort of political remit of transmission. I mean, you're doing work across a lot of theoretical and critical, but also physical um, bases. But yes, I, th I thought this one as well kind of stood out of thinking about, particularly thinking again in terms of spaces and the loss of space. So maybe... I get to use the first question and maybe back to you. Maybe because we're talking about space now, mm -hmm. I think you're really brave because I'm uh, usually not <laughs> feeling cold quite It's easy. freezing. It is freezing <laughs> and I have to put my jacket on. Yes, I was please like, do. no, I can do this one hour <laughs> No, talk. no, don't, don't do so, it. So, Sarah, you can uh, start <laughs> okay. answering. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really want to do it. I just do it and people are confused. I, like, I did warn you. <laughs> I can hold your mic. <laughs> I did warn you, yeah, it's okay. um, 20 meter high ceilings is going to do it. Yeah. Yes, spaces. I, I guess it was the um, solidarity mm. podcast where yeah. Akan Afan oh, yeah, yeah. Um, spoke about um, about gentrification mm. and all of that. Um, yeah, I guess, do you want to? No, you can. Um, sorry, uh, what, what, what was I going to say? Um, oh, maybe. Uh, if you want to... Yeah, just go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, because maybe going back to your first question to Sarah, how to kind of transmit mm. communities and, and create access for different kinds yes. of people. I think that's a tricky question because we are always... Um, I mean, we talk about that a lot. We are always kind of tending to something that, that we know, to the recognition of the... Um, you are the, the what's the German word? Um, familiar. Yeah, familiar. yeah. So that's how communities or networks mm. are built. Mm -hmm. um, but then we always have to kind of step back and reflect on access and exclusion mm. and inclusion in in terms of who isn't part and why aren't they part? Mm. Um, and to give an example, just from like the job market, where it's about okay, are you addressing different possible people and groups to to apply for your jobs and then they're like yeah we want to but um they don't apply and then it's like yeah but why don't they apply? yeah and yeah, because, maybe yeah, it's yeah. also because mm -hmm. they don't want to be part of your institution maybe mm -hmm. you have to really mm -hmm. start questioning structures and infrastructures and i think that's a big topic we have to look at also when looking at how exclusive sound system culture or male centered sound system culture is and they're like well <laughs> we want women to take part or Flint people or mm. her, you know take part and um, but they don't mm. and that's like well <laughs> or they form you know against sometimes great odds they form their own but you know as a marginalized yeah. knowing, knowing that you're going to be marginalized yeah. um, I, I was thinking of um, I think they're called boss the black obsidian sound system in in, in Britain which has sort of equally an education outreach mm -hmm. for you know um, women, everybody really, trans, um, but, you know, of a, young, of a younger age, and then are also artists and photographers. So, you know, they're using the full spectrum of club culture in a way, you know, so, um, and, so, you know, obviously sound to, um, yes, to move away from the, all oh, those tr traditional conceptions that sounds, sound machines are somehow the to go back to this point, are uh, somehow the preserve of men. And uh, <clears throat> sorry, maybe again, Sarah, I was thinking about what is it or how, what sort of perceptual shift is happening for us? Or is there a difference when women use these sound machines that are thought to be male machines? You know, like the whole arriving at a club. DJ in the DJ setup. Is it a test? Maybe in your earlier, yeah. earlier years of DJing, was it a test? Like, mm -hmm. can she find where you know, yeah. the cross fader is or something? All, all kinds of weird yeah. things yeah. and patronizing and also at good times mm -hmm. where people just treat me like a normal person. Mm -hmm. um, but now, yeah, there is a shift happening. But um, yeah. I actually forgot to say that earlier, but I believe there's a responsibility with all participants in club culture. And, you know, if you're a DJ, you know, can you, you can try to do your research. What kind of club is it? Is it accessible? Do they have safer space policies? All those kind of things. And I think um, when a club is wondering why they're so straight, male, whatever, um, you have to look within yourself. And it, it starts with yourself, basically. And 
they have to be ready to start their process. I feel like it's almost like a spiritual process, mm -hmm. to be honest, mm -hmm. um, to ask yourself uncomfortable questions. And I learned that from Kerstin <laughs> to ask always many questions. <laughs> Asking questions. Question. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Question. I like it. <laughs> um, yeah. And just uh, that's also part of my DJ workshops where I'm like. You know, what kind of dance world do you want to create? Mm. What kind of people is this place for? Mm. Who is this, like, who can't access the place? And where is the club located? Mm. Um, and uh, that's also interesting when we talk about music production machines and the language that we use there. Al also when it comes to race, you know, like, we have this master and slave thing. Yeah. And it's just really wrong yeah, <laughs> it's just yeah. it's time for a fucking update sorry yeah. <laughs> but I mean, yeah it, it's really funny <laughs> because um lewis trudy sakai who was the speaker just before you from um coming in from boston or on the zoom uh, yes on zoom by boston um you know he's written about the history of sort of black he calls it black techno poetics the absolute historical entanglement of blacks mm -hmm. with technology even though perhaps in the west it's often seen that you know, those two things are very far apart or, very, you know, antithetical. Um, and yes, yeah, so he was critiquing that the very um, foundation of cybernetic culture and is based on this notion of master and slave. You yes. Know? yes, and also like with certain DJ programs, um, when they analyze your tracks, it's only like four to the floor. Mm. It's like mm. different kind of polyrhythms. Mm. They, the program just can't handle it, mm. you know. So, um, I mean, that maybe that says a lot about... Um, Without wanting to re reduce it to a kind of essentialist femi feminism or the f um, not essentialist feminism or an essentialism of, mm -hmm. of women, for that historically, historically, philosophically, women have been seen as fluid and un uncontained. So this idea then that you know we we like our nice binaries of master slave male female, mm -hmm. and then you get this more polymorphous thing that won't fit into the models that have been created mm -hmm. and then the system breaks down. Yeah. Right, <laughs> yes. That's, that's the thing with, with why people are, or many people are so confused with um, the gender debates that are mm. happening. Mm. Like what, you're telling me there are more genders than just two? two? <laughs> you know, God. and I, I can empathize yeah. with that because I didn't, uh, I wasn't born and was just woke in a second, mm. you know. Mm. Mm. It took me time and it mm. still takes me time and mm. there's still many things that I don't really get and the language is also always in, in, in a process mm. and one day this word is the political correct one and the and next day the other yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's that's the way to move forward there's no other way mm. and people are complex but I think that's something that um, in transmission the two of you have talked about of being okay in the moment of the being uncomfortable because it's about this is why I was thinking about, you know, trying to tease out the <laughs> multivalent layers of transmission because I, I see it as, you know, there are these layers that we have to go through, um, you know, the, tran the transitive um, understanding of it, of, we're trying to get somewhere. Maybe you can write a philosophy about the trans, <laughs> trans transmission. Maybe you can, you yes. can, yeah, that's what I, you know. <laughs> people just come up with names, yeah. but then they are creating yeah. these interesting yeah. definitions yeah. and make it sound really deep. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's you, you're saying no, I should, but it's you saying I should be in advertising. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> can you can you be our manager? <laughs> no, no. I, mean, I think that's I, I, I barely able to measure, manage myself. <laughs> I think, <laughs> but maybe just adding yes. to this uh, deconstruction. Yeah. in order to rebuild I yeah. think it fits perfectly with the, the, the questioning mm. or question like mm. you know um, confronting ourselves with this feeling uncomfort mm. or discomfort and feeling something doesn't sit right mm. and then trying to find the root of it and questioning like why are th aren't these people part of that mm. why are you trying to cater to a ABC and, and where's DEF and um yeah, just kind of um, looking at how how we have built the world we live in right now and how it also doesn't work for the times we live in right now mm. and, and what are the things we have to change and um, just really realizing our interconnection with what's there. And um, I think that's why we need to focus on, emphasize on sound and maybe mm. a kind of feminine philosophy or even like... Um, feminist theory, queer theory mm. that is transversal and looking um, across or in between and, and um, 
like this uh, pseudo exis, uh, exis, um, essential mm -hmm. entities, you know, like gender or bodies. What is a body? I mean, yeah. where does it end and where where does it start? Is my skin the kind of uh, border or it's just, yeah. I mean, that was, that was the thing I was going to come to in terms of this sort of transversal border crossing, you know, the borders between bodies, between human, between animal. And what, uh, again, one of the, um, one of the areas that I really like in terms of which transmissionnet.org is, <laughs> is operating is that it's looking beyond the human. So you're engaging with the Anthropocene, with, um, you know, with environmentalism, thinking about the politics of environmental, environmentalism for the punters, as you said you once were, or the dance floor. The word I learned. The punters, <laughs> yes. You know, the, the, yeah, but this um, responsibility. Maybe, maybe you can say a bit more about that, actually. So we asked um, people from our network and community um, if we would produce a podcast, what would be topics they would be interested in. Mm. So it really is a shout out to the people who answered the questions and gave feedback, really valuable feedback, that we came up with these three topics, solidarity, sustainability, mm. and then reset. Yeah. And we decided we wanted to give space and share the space and just um, be kind of in the background and curate, but not really take part in the conversations because there are so many great artists and people out there um, doing great work and also highlighting, highlighting their work. Mm. And in the sustainability um, conversation, I found it really interesting that we were talking a lot about drug policy as well, um, which I think hasn't been highlighted that much mm -hmm. within a sustainability discourse. And again, I think because club culture isn't really represented in a lot of art, art, also art spaces, we always think of museums, theatres, yeah, um, yeah. what else? Uh, yeah, that clubs can't galleries do yes, and yes. Are, and clubs. It's it's this hedonistic, mm -hmm. um, self uh, related or self self abusing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, yeah, you're just yeah. um, it's just mm. pleasure. And it's mm. like yeah, and <laughs> that's good mm. because uh, we need that and we need to experience communality with other people mm. and not just um, be in our brains and think about the world, but also experience it. And I think the club space is such an important space for that. Mm -hmm. And it is embedded within um, a bigger sociopolitical space, a natural space. Um, and uh, there are a lot of activists and um, organizations who are addressing uh, club spaces as um, sustainable spaces and what has to be changed. So for us, it was really important to to look at that, but mm. from different angles mm -hmm. and not just, mm -hmm. oh, we don't use plastic straws anymore. And at the same time, we probably need straws. I mean, although we are not really um, friendly for people in a wheelchair, for example, mm -hmm. but some people might need straws. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, these conversations are always really layered. And, um, and, yeah. and have to go beyond sort of gesture of politics. It is easy for us to, yes. I mean, it's the complexity of thinking, well, who does need straws right yeah. but it's very easy for us to say okay that's it i'm not using plastic straws ever again you know without thinking well what are the logical consequences for people who are different or other to mm. us right um so yeah i think that's this thing that comes through very much with transmission there that this kind of responsibility that seems to make the music culture more than music culture right yeah it's um you know and, and maybe to go back to your your point about black church um you know maybe that was kind of the, the original conceptions of this you know that it's it's a culture that you're involved in and you take care of each other it's not just about we come here on a sunday we worship and then we go home or or we come to the club on a saturday night maybe we go to church on the sunday then we go home um but yeah this this wider sense of responsibility not just to ourselves as humans but to the environment um you know to non-human things right um so yeah i think that's the kind of critical thread that i thought was it was different about transmission.net that it was actually encroaching into spheres because most people would say well or not most people often it might be said, well, we can barely, humans, we can barely stand each other, so that's the first level. But actually, then to go on and say, well, yeah, there's a, there's a wider ecology to it, yeah. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say maybe we should really um, dance more <sighs> like, and dance together yeah. to, to really yeah. over, also to create some, some space mm. beside this heavily loaded um, political debates and everything. Mm. I sometimes mm. really think um, being in your body and mm. um, experiencing a togetherness in a physical way on the dance floor um, could really help connecting and, under and having this mutual feeling of what Sarah always says, like creating this utopia. And not in a naive sense of like, oh, we dance um, rave racism yeah, away. Yeah, rave racism <laughs> away and it doesn't and everyone and is equal. Like that. <laughs> and everyone so is equal on the dance floor, which is and 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 we had so, yeah. these conversations where people were like, okay, now you kind of sit down and do like political discussions on mm. the dance floor because people are allowed to rave. Mm. And it's like mm. no. And it's political with a with a small P and mm. not a politic uh, um, capital P yeah. where it's like, you know, it, it's commodified, it's monetized, it's um gentrified mm. it's um all sorts of things yeah. so we have to look at it as a cultural political and social yeah. space yeah. and um but yeah. i think that's what we uh, you know when we we met a little while ago to think about how we might frame this you know that's one of the things that we saw that you know the sort of and, and obviously what you're <coughs> excuse me picking um picking up um in the you know in the activist work that you're doing, I don't see it as separate to what you're doing. I see it as just another part of what you're doing. It's not that you think, I have to go out and do some activism <laughs> in the club at the weekend. But this sort of long... His I brought some books. <laughs> this sort of long <laughs> historical tra trajectory <laughs> and, you know, often led by women. You know, I think, yes, yes yeah. right? So of, true. Yeah, of, of the connection between music politics and of the dance floor which is sort of your sub subtitle right or to your <coughs> excuse me your um HKV podcast right the politics yeah. of dance floor so yeah i think this this sense you know and i think back then we talked about you know from the clearing of the dance floor for the solemnity of billy holiday's str you know strange fruit i think she wouldn't play she wouldn't sing it until the dance floor was cleared and the lights were dimmed to you know, I think we talked about the ball, um, the ball house moments. Sorry, yes, the ball, the ball, um, ball yes, room. ball room, yeah, ball house. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> the ballroom uh, movement, and again, this space. When you when you've both talked about the creation of safer spaces in the club in the club context, um, and interestingly, but obviously not since COVID, you know, that was a really emergent space here in Berlin. Um, yeah, that, um, and then yes, again, how that gets picked up again at political moments, Black Lives Matters, um, yeah, so yeah, um, and I, I think it's so important to say, I mean, I always say it, but I'm gonna keep saying it. <laughs> I really realized that everyone is problematic in certain contexts, you know, and we all have work to do, and I just wish for more of my male colleagues that they a get asked the same question as me. Mm -hmm. Like, why do you think it is there are not so many female um, and trans Why people? do you think it is? Oh. There are so many male yeah. DJs. Yeah. And those kind of things. Like, please, yeah. out yes. there, people, yeah. please yeah. ask my male colleagues yeah. because they have so much more power. Mm -hmm. They have the responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, I want to build accountability culture where it can normalize to um, go through um, conflict and, like in a peaceful way. Mm -hmm. I think we have to practice that mm -hmm. because everything comes down to conflict at the end of the day I feel like and <coughs> most of us are not really equipped okay. thank you to um, handle conflict mm -hmm. and um, <coughs> I want to say that like it's it's always as, as you said you know it's uh, you can see that mostly women are involved in activism or it seems mm -hmm. like it mm -hmm. you know mostly black people mm -hmm. but it's not only like a women's issue, it's also men issues yeah. and... It's everyone's issue. It's everyone's it's issues, issues yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, when people hear, hear the word political um, dance floor or whatever, they're like, oh my God, I just want to have fun. I'm just okay. going to go and sit on the <laughs> dance floor and pick it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, and I don't want any music. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I just want to really say that yeah. it can be so much fun to, to be political mm. and to be engaged in that, you know. It's not just like 
oh, now I have to watch all those uh, depressing documentaries and I feel shame all the time mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. white guilt or whatever it, it may be. Um, and that's, you know, that's the part of the process to feel actually uncomfortable. Yeah. And yeah, we keep yeah, coming back, back to, to that. This, yeah. 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 But to sit in the mess mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just like be with that for a while before you move on yeah. and work through that. And, you know, that's like a big thing. But like for me, <laughs> my goal is like world peace. How can we get there? <laughs> yeah. Of course, that's utopia as well. But like. But I think it goes back to that. <clears throat> what you were saying, well, you were both saying at the beginning of it might be utopic, but there is that creation in the space, and especially as the, I'm going to need you to say it again, the energy exchange. Ener the energy exchange. Yeah, why, why won't that stick? Um, you know, and, and your role as the affect engineer, you are um, engineering the dynamics, the, the the feel, the the mood and the atmosphere of the floor. Um, yeah, sorry, I just got caught up on energy I'm like, exchange. I'm just like <laughs> so appreciative thinking about all those amazing dance floor yeah, moments and yeah. staring. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> I, but I mean, <laughs> it's like, yeah, effect engineer. Yes, I'm yeah. I mean, that's not me. I think that comes from maybe Kojo Ishan or Julian Emery because I wish it had come from me. But it, there is this sense of, um, you know, that. Yeah, sorry, that's what I was going to say, that, that there can be, you know, and I'm sure we've all had those nights historically when everything felt like, you know, all, everything was aligned and it was this great space where, you know, you, were, you wanted to be the last one out of the club because it was this utopic space just, you know, in, you know, what gets called this temporary autonomous zone, this heterogeneous space where it may dissolve but it's at least, and maybe to come back to this sense of the, the DJ as like being premonitory that they can kind of see, um, see ahead and they have to, to anticipate people's feelings or engineer people's feelings. Um, yeah, about the potential. I mean, that's what I really like both about your work, this kind of grasping of this, the radical potential of what sounds can do. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I also want to say, because... I think it's dangerous to assume that every DJ has the same intention. Mm. There are many DJ, DJs out there, they do it mostly for themselves because they're like being on the stage or yes. they're not interested in playing in clubs that only can hold like 200 people mm. or so. And that's okay. Mm. As Kerstin says, there's space for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't look at me. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, yeah, there's so many, like DJ can also means superstar these mm, days mm, and mm. being a hyper-capitalist or whatever. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's crazy how this has evolved over the years. But um, yeah, I just wish for, that makes me think of wishing uh, for more accountability when it comes to like bigger DJs who have mm, like Thank a big, bigger platform yeah. um, to support each other more. Because it's mostly the people that you don't see who do most of the work, work yeah. you know. I mean, I mean, that brings me to the question of <coughs> post-COVID, you know, uh, fingers and everything crossed for this. Um, where does c transmission net go? So what is next? Offline. <laughs> <laughs> Offline. <laughs> I'm back into oh, the yeah. clubs. <laughs> like, yeah. If yeah. we if we could, I guess, yeah. um, just disconnecting from Instagram and all that and creating a newsletter mm. and just really building offline spaces mm -hmm. and just having, ex like, real-time exchange with people. But um, very mm, soon we're going to um, expand on the politics of the Dance Floor podcast mm -hmm. and take it to the uh, newly formed Refuge Worldwide Radio in Berlin as a bi-monthly kind of podcast where, first of all, we start to just have conversations and then maybe combine social, socio-political commentary and music and club culture and connecting different topics mm -hmm. that we anyway always talk about. And then hopefully um, create this panel with Mike Bangs and um, wow. Samira Hamid Sharifu next year at HKV, which was there. now postponed yeah. uh, postponed again yes. um, because it's everything That's is two so years unclear. Now, no, right? it's next year. Yeah, it's two years. years. At, yeah, yeah. yeah. <sighs> because unfortunately, um, we can't be as precise as mm. Boris Johnson mm. with on the twenty first of June, <laughs> COVID is over, and then we're gonna to regret that decision. Every, yes. <laughs> everything is uh, yeah. happening again. Yeah. But yeah, just we are doing this besides okay. our other. Um, kind of jobs and careers so just really staying passionate about um, 
having these conversations and kind of going with the flow. We ha we don't follow like a big ambition. <laughs> Okay, well, um, unfortunately, we are out of time there. I would love... Well, I, would love I wanted I to ask to you a question, but maybe we can... Well, we were asking each other questions. I just want to say thank you so much to Sarah Farina and to Kerstin Meissner, uh, transmissionnet.org. And, um, yeah, thank you so much for this kind of... Um, yes, thinking about sounding and sound systems in a wider context outside of the formal conceptions of it. Thank you so much, yeah. Jessica. Yeah, really lovely. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.